Society got together to put this conference together, one of the first things I remember Michael Harris saying was, well, one thing we're going to want to explore is why are the police shooting so many unarmed black people, black men? And so that's always been kind of a guiding uh, thought or guiding question that we had for this conference. Um, Philip Goff was to be here. Many of you have seen him, heard his work, seen his work. He's a good big, uh, Chris Hayes on MSNBC is a big fan of his. He is doing on the ground work as many of us are with the Department of Justice. And I just learned about 10 days ago that he has to do something for the Department of Justice. So Jack Glazer, who works with him extensively, um, is going to be presenting on that. Um, I've done a little bit of work with police shootings. I'll talk about that in a minute. But we decided we would tweak this uh, presentation a little bit to talk not just about police shootings, but the George Zimmerman type situation, where you have um, armed citizens, residents shooting people of color, killing people of color. So um, the first speaker will be Jack. I think I met him um, when I was over at the Goldman School. He is, I think, the one of the big high people there. He is the, I think, associate dean. Um, and he uh, got his PhD, like many of these people, there are all these PhD folks, um, got his PhD from Yale. Um, he and I were on, a, on the uh, Michael Krasny show on Forum right after the Ferguson non-indictments came down. And I was really happy to hear him talk about his social science expertise, but also to connect it to the rage and anger and anguish we were feeling about the fact that Michael Brown's body was in the street for so long and that the person who shot him is walking the streets uh, uh, safely today. So uh, we'll start with Jack Glazer, and then I'll come and talk about uh, non-police murders of black folks. Jack. Thank you, Eva. I want to start by saying uh, I will be talking primarily about implicit bias. Um, but I don't want us to fall into the trap of thinking that the root problem is implicit bias. The root problem is the structure of our society and the stratification of our society and the segregation of our society and, and, and all societies. And so it's important to talk about implicit bias because implicit bias is a conduit through which these stratifications get perpetuated. Uh, and there are, as Buju was describing, some things that we can do about it. Uh, but it's not the root problem and it's not going to be the solution. Uh, we nevertheless need to deal with it and talk about it, and it can help us explain a lot about what's going on with policing in America today and, and help us to come up with some, some solutions. But I just don't want us to be naive in thinking that, the, that implicit bias is the be-all, end-all. It's the problem and the solution. It's a problem, and there are solutions, but we need to be thinking about bigger, bigger issues as well. So does anybody see a triangle? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Maybe two? Yeah. Maybe for members of the tribe like me, you might see a, a <laughs> Mug and David. Um, what, what's the definition of a triangle? Three-sided. Side. Well, that's an equilateral triangle. But, oh. uh, and, and that's what we have here. But. I was with you. <laughs> so uh, three-sided, three angles. Contiguous, is that here? Mm, Actually, no. Not really. No, there are suggestions of triangles here, but we see it instantaneously. And you might even see what looks like a, a line here, slightly darker on this side than on this side, and that's that's purely an illusion. Mm. The all that's appearing, all that's being projected here, are these angles. How, how is that possible that we're seeing triangles when tr there's no triangle there? Well, the reason I'm starting with this is to say that this is, and, and already Leslie and Buju have, have foreshadowed this, this is how our minds work. Uh, we are never presented with complete information about anything, let alone about other people that we're making decisions about or that we're behaving toward. And even if we were presented with complete information, with some, about something as complex as a human being, we wouldn't be able to uh, we wouldn't be able to accommodate all of that information, and so we use cognitive shortcuts. And our brains are good at seeing things schematically. So we have a prior schema for a triangle, and when we're presented with all this information that suggests a triangle, we see a triangle. 
But in fact, this might just be, you know, six objects that are just suggestive of a triangle. And that's how we see other people. We see, we see parts of information about other people, and we fill in the schema based on our, oh, I just got mentioned on Twitter. I'm so excited. My phone just told me. Isn't that great? <laughs> Which one of you was it? <laughs> Chris. All right. <laughs> I have this out as a timer, but, you know, that's the downside. All right, so um, all, all of my 88 followers will, uh, will know. <laughs> so I'm still trying to get more followers than I follow, and you know, it's just pathetic. So, um, okay, so, so this is how we process information about other people. Uh, and stereotypes are one of those schemas. And the stereotypes that I'll talk about at length are the schemas that hold together knowledge about groups that people belong, belong to and traits that are associated with those groups. Stereotyping is normal human cognition, and this is something that uh, we need to acknowledge right from the start. And this is part of why I'm saying that uh, implicit bias and implicit stereotyping is not the root problem. It better not be because we all do it and we're all always going to do it. And so uh, we're not going to be able to eliminate that entirely. So, uh, but for now, let's just talk more generally about stereotypes, implicit, explicit, uh, of, of various varieties. And stereotypes are beliefs about the traits that are disproportionately possessed by members of a group. As I said, this is normal. They serve functions. I'm going to run through very rapidly some of the, some, some of the centuries worth of psychological research on stereotyping. Uh, just to give you a sense of kind of how, how systematically they've been studied, but I don't want to take too much time talking about that particularly. But the, the root understanding is that there, this is normal human cognition. It enables us to process information fairly rapidly and, and in many cases systematically and meaningfully and even, and even uh, functionally. Stereotypes can be inaccurate. And there, it used to be that the definition of a stereotype was an inaccurate generalization about a group. And we've sort of shed, shed that to say that they are just beliefs about groups. And they're going to be, in some cases, more or less accurate. But it's not so much, and, and they can be completely inaccurate. There's a whole phenomenon called illusory correlation, where stereotypes can be formed just purely by a perceived correlation between a group and a trait that's not there at all. Um, they do tend to be resistant to change, as came up earlier. Um, but even if they're quote unquote accurate, even if you say, yes, this group does tend to engage in this kind of behavior more than that group, when we make judgments about individuals based on that prior conception, we discriminate against those individuals. And there are, there are virtually no traits on which any two groups differ so dramatically that the stereotype about the group is going to be a useful diagnostic or criterion for determining predicting how somebody's going to behave, or whether they're engaged in crime, or violence, or um, cheating. This is my central thesis. Uh, stereotyping is normal. Police officers are normal human beings with normal cognition. And the only pushback I ever get from that is when I talk to police audiences, by the way. Um, and you're to be commended for not chuckling, because sometimes people do. So police are normal humans with normal cognition. Stereotyping is normal. There are pervasive stereotypes within our society, within our culture, linking people of color with crime and violence, particularly black men. Uh, and, um, and we now know from research actually looking at police officers that they have these stereotypes and that they influence their judgments. So when we're trying to figure out what's causing these disproportionate rates of people of color being stopped and searched and arrested, as well as lethal and non-lethal force being used against them, understanding the stereotypes that drive the behavior of the police toward people of color is going to be very valuable. And we'll get to the implicit aspect of that soon. So um, I just, I'm going to run through these topics very briefly. Again, I want to just kind of whet your appetite for them. And then I'm um, happy to talk more about anything that you're curious about later on. But I also want to make sure we get down to the use of force issues. So one important distinction here is that uh, stereotyping and prejudice are not the same thing. We tend to think of them as going hand in hand, and to an extent they do. But we want to make an important distinction that stereotypes are a more cognitive 
construct, that they reflect the, uh, the associations between concepts, like uh, being from a particular group and having a particular trait, being black and being prone to crime, being a woman and being nurturing. And a prejudice is the more affective side. It's the more emotional side of those attitudes. So that's the, where you have the association between the group and feelings of positivity or negativity. And we want to distinguish between those because as it turns out, the research shows that prejudice and stereotyping differentially predict uh, the policing behavior. And so if we're going to get at the root of that problem, we want to identify the cause. Uh, just briefly, func the function that stereotypes serve is, as I suggested before, to help us organize information, process information, and to do so in an efficient way. And so instead of having to uh, pursue more and more information about another person, we can kind of cut to the chase by making an inference about what they're like and how they're going to behave based on a prior conception or stereotype that we have. Um, there are other functions of stereotypes, but essentially it's a, the, what's been called the cognitive miser function. It, it uh, stores, it helps us to um, reserve our cognitive resources so that they can be uh, used for other purposes. And research has shown that when people are tired, they're more likely to stereotype. When they're given the opportunity to stereotype, they have more cognitive resources left over for other things. It's very, very well established. The process, I'm going to say briefly, is something that is often misunderstood. People think of stereotypes as being very deliberately applied to make judgments. But the, the general way in which stereotypes influence our judgments is that, again, we're presented with ambiguous and incomplete information about others. And the stereotype serves as a lens through which we interpret the behavior of those others. So we, we, the stereotypes help us disambiguate ambiguous information about others in a manner that's consistent with the prior theory we have that's driven by that stereotypic schema. And it's, it's also been shown that the mere knowledge of the stereotype, you don't have to even endorse it, you just have to know that other people hold that stereotype, is sufficient to cause you to judge somebody in a manner that's consistent with that stereotype. So if you know that other people hold the stereotype that black men are prone to crime, even if you disavow that stereotype, when you are presented with a black person, that stereotype will be activated and if you are distracted, you, you might interpret some of their, that person's ambiguous behavior in a manner that's consistent with the stereotype and see them as being uh, suspicious. And I'm saying you, and I know that makes you uncomfortable, but we all do it. <laughs> uh, stereotypes are formed through uh, all kinds of exposures to media and, and actual direct experience with other people and, um, and, uh, and reading and you know there's and 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 all, even from our families in fact that's a big source of of stereotype content but they can also be learned completely spuriously uh, and there are different traps that we fall into in that regard uh, they are generally resistant to change this came up earlier and even when presented as was mentioned earlier with a strong counter stereotypic uh, example like Barack Obama uh, or Allison uh, said this has happened to her as well. Uh, people do have the tendency to subtype, to take that individual, put them in a separate category to preserve the stereotypic category. And you can imagine why that would be adaptive if we were, if our stereotypes or our beliefs in general were constantly in flux and prone to being challenged and threatened, it would be pretty hard to navigate our social environment. And, and just as if we were never really sure we were seeing a triangle, it would be hard, uh, it would be hard to understand geometry. Uh, there's some research also showing that when people try effortfully to suppress their stereotypes, that, has, that works temporarily but tends to have these rebound effects where the stereotypes are even more influential later. Uh, part of that is because the process of monitoring for the stereotype influencing your judgments causes you to be activating the stereotype. Uh, and this, is, this gets back to what Buju was saying, that our implicit system is, she is the nice term dumb, I prefer the term stupid, and which is a little harsher, um, but she's more, she's more gracious than I am. <laughs> so uh, so the, the implicit system is very simplistic, and it's about simple associations between these cognitive ideas. And, uh, and so um, suppressing a stereotype as long as you still have that suppression motivation active might be effective, but as soon as it's gone, the, 
the suppression activities are activating the stereotype all over the place. In terms of content, I mentioned before that uh, media are common sources. We had Travis Dixon speaking to us the other day about this and how you know, there's this multi-layered effect to the media that one, media overrepresents crime and violent crime. And then within that, they overrepresent crime that's committed by African Americans, and they overrepresent crime where victims are white. Uh, and that all has the effect of causing people to think there's more crime than there is, and that amongst that crime, it's being, it's being carried out disproportionately by African Americans. And police are not immune to that, that information as well. I'll just skip over this. OK, so this brings us to implicit stereotypes. What I've said so far could be applied to explicit or implicit. It's just the nature and the structure and the process and the function of stereotypes. Uh, but what we now know from several decades of social psychological work and several more decades of cognitive psychological work is that stereotypes, like most of our thoughts and feelings, operate largely outside of conscious awareness and control. And that, too, is highly adaptive. If we had to be thinking about everything that we do, particularly our social engagements, if we had to be consciously, explicitly, effortfully thinking about who this person is, what they're going to do, it would be paralyzing. And, and so instead, we have this capacity for, for using these prior conceptions to disambiguate and to do so rapidly, effortlessly. And we're doing it without our, our knowledge of doing it. And what cognitive psychologists taught us was that we can actually measure this. We can identify when people, are, uh, when people are thinking about things they don't even know that they're thinking about. Our, our, our implicit system is, is stupid, but our minds are really quite amazing. And they are capable of parallel processing and of managing lots of information simultaneously. The problem is, as has been coming up, we have a hard time differentiating what are the valid external cues and what are the prior biases that are influencing our interpretation of events. So I would say I'm comfortable saying that most memory is implicit, uh, it, or possibly even the overwhelming majority of memory operates implicitly, and, auto, and that most mental processing is automatic. You don't think when you encounter, when I encounter Eva, I don't think, now what is her name? Her name just pops into my head, right? That's implicit memory, and, and that's how most of our processing works. It, again, it would be debilitating and paralyzing if we had to consciously think about each person and all of these little things. But in addition to her name, lots of other attributes, like what a wonderful person she is, um, by the way, uh, come, come to mind. So I had to get that in there. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, all right. So, um, so let, me, let me try to um, demonstrate how uh, this is measured. And I'm sure many of you now have gone to Project Implicit and done the implicit association test. But I'm going to run through the basic process of it um, in order to not just show how it works, but to try to show how the way it, it's constructed translates into uh, a measurement of implicit memory or of implicit bias. And so uh, let me also start by saying this is the, the design of social psychologists, Mazarin Banaji and Tony Greenwald, uh, but it was based on these decades of work by cognitive psychologists who used other related procedures, including presenting people with subliminal stimuli, uh, images and words that appear so rapidly that you don't even know you saw anything, let alone what it was. And it turns out that even when you see a subliminal image, it gets registered. You, you categorize it, you have all kinds of cognitions about it, and it influences judgments of subsequent stimuli and other, and other things. So we know from the cognitive psychology that we process things even when we don't have any conscious awareness of having been exposed to them. And what Greenwald and Banaji did was to take that knowledge that we have these mental associations in our heads that can be measured and to develop a procedure that was highly replicable, fairly straightforward, and yielded robust, reliable, measures of people's implicit associations. So in the implicit association test, you'll have people um, categorizing uh, words or images, and I'm just going to keep it all unimodal and use words only, uh, into categories. 
And uh, first they would you know, be asked to just categorize words as pleasant or unpleasant. So words like vomit and would be categorized as unpleasant. I just like to use that word, so it always gets a rise out of people. Peace as unpleasant. Um, and then, then they would be asked, well, OK, now we want you to use these same two buttons on your keyboard to categorize words as relating to insects or flowers. So you hit the left key for, for insect centipede, and you hit the right key for daisy. And you do uh, you know, 20 to 40 trials like this where you're categorizing. And then they combine them, and they say, well, now use the left key just to, to categorize things as pleasant or insects, uh, and the right key to categorize things as unpleasant or flowers. And you can imagine that would be a little bit hard because we tend to find flowers to be quite pleasant and insects to be unpleasant. But when you switch the order up and now you pair pleasant and flower together and unpleasant and insect together, people tend to find that much easier. Even if this one was done first, you know, you can reverse the order of these. But generally speaking, people are better at categorizing pleasant and flower and unpleasant and insect, except in their original story, uh, study, story, it's kind of a story, in their original study, they, uh, they actually were able to get a subsample of entomologists at the University of, of Washington, and they didn't show a preference. And we call that criterion group validity. This is, it's, in the, it's in the paper. Uh, criterion group validity, this group that you would expect to be different behaves differently in the manner consistent with what you'd expect. So the IIT is not just getting this global thing, it's getting something that's specific to people's experiences and preferences. What they then did was to replace the, uh, the flowers and insects uh, with a new sample of, of uh, participants with uh, names that are stereotypically associated with black people and white people like Jamal and Brandon. And we, we've, we social psychologists have developed all these sets of race stereotypical names and lots of faces. And these days, this would more, more likely be done with fa pictures of people's faces to, to do the racial categorization. Um, but you know, here we would you would have a pairing, and you're asked to categorize things as being good words or names of black people on the left key, and bad words and names of white people on the right key. So you're going to go, you know, vomit, Jamal, peace, Brandon, and uh, and then in the other block, and you do that about 40 times, and in the other block, you do uh, you're now pairing good with white and bad with black, and it turns out that most people, especially people who aren't black find this pairing to be much easier. And when I say much easier, they do it faster and they make fewer errors. And these are measured in milliseconds. So it might be that on average, uh, people tend to do this about 200 milliseconds faster per trial, per response, than here. And when you collect 40 trials of that and you standardize the data, it turns out to be something fairly robust and you can calculate an index for each person to, to, to uh, index the extent to which this is easier than that, and it turns out that correlates with pretty much all the things that you would expect it to correlate with, like explicit prejudice, but only weakly. So, um, so what the IAT is able to do is construct this measure at the individual person level, and across a lot of different things, black, white, good, bad. But the slide I was about to show was black, white, weapon, tool. And that's a task that we've used. Let me uh, let's see if I can get that going. We'll see what happens. Um, and, and so you can actually measure the implicit stereotype uh, that is the association between black people and weapons uh, versus white people and weapons. And we can take the implicit stereotype that associates uh, blacks with weapons. And in one set of studies, uh, Jennifer Eberhardt and Phil Goff, uh, who I, I was supposed to mention earlier, I'm sorry, Phil can't be here. Uh, I'm, I'm a much less charismatic version of him. And, um, but he's been known to say that he and I share a brain. So, and we do work very closely together on, on, on these issues. So I'll do, I'll do my best to approximate Goffness. So, um, so what Phil and Jennifer Eberhardt uh, and their colleagues did in one particular study was to present people with subliminal images of black or white faces. So one at a time, you know, uh, per trial, they would see a black face appear for maybe about 30 milliseconds. People had no conscious awareness of having seen anything, let alone what it was. And as a result, I like the musical accompaniment. Um, and as a result, they had, uh, they, they subsequently had them perceive another set of stimuli 
that was an image that was becoming undegraded. And so they're, they are seeing something that's blurry and, and pixelated, and it is, over time, becoming clearer what that image is. And some of those images are weapons, like guns, handguns, and some of them are non-weapon harmless objects. And the finding is that when people are presented with the black faces subliminally, well, it looks like we're going to be able to actually see what that looks like. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Unless I crash it again. Okay, so this is the kind of image that they would see. Uh, and there, there would be lots of different instances of black or white faces. And they would only see it very briefly. They didn't even know that they saw it. And then they're asked, and this happens much more slowly, but as a set of images like this becomes less and less ambiguous, and probably this is another little mind bug, is that having seen this, you now look at that and say, oh, yeah, I see the gun coming. But if you had not seen this, yeah. that would look a lot more ambiguous. And so as, as this unfolds, people who are, have been, ex or when people have been exposed to the blackface, they are quicker to identify this as a weapon uh, than when they're presented with white faces. I'm going to come back to this study in a little bit. Oops. I don't trust that little clicker anymore. OK. <laughs> so it's also been shown uh, that implicit bias, as measured by the IAT primarily, the implicit association test, but other measures as well, has been shown to correlate with actual behaviors, actual discriminatory behaviors. And these are just some examples, but they range from employment discrimination. So the stronger somebody's implicit bias is, uh, the less likely they are to recommend hiring a person from the group that, that they are biased against. Resource allocation, actual med medical decision making, um, uh, voting in the 2008 election where we conveniently had a black and white uh, presidential candidate and some implicit bias data. Uh, even suicidality uh, and different kinds of crime. Uh, and then use of force, which brings us to the shooter task. So this is, these are some sample stimuli from the shooter task developed by Josh Carell and his colleagues at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, and again, there, there are about 56 total stimuli. That's a, the number that we tend to use in my lab uh, of white and black men who are either holding guns or cell phones or some other non-weapon object. And as I can't remember who it was, uh, Buju or, or Leslie, somebody was talking about it earlier, the task is to quote unquote, shoot uh, the person, and they see one at a time, and you, sh you shoot the person if he's holding a gun, and you do that as fast as possible. But you also give the no shoot response as fast as you can if he's holding a non gun, if he's holding something else. <laughs> uh, what Eric Knowles and I found was that when we measured using an IAT, this black white weapon tool stereotype, in fact, that predicted the strength of the shooter bias. So the more people associated blacks with weapons, the stronger their result on the shooter task. And in our case, we actually used a trigger response that was more, more realistic. Um, and, uh, uh, but we also measured the black-white good-bad IAT, which did not correlate with shooter bias. And this is a, a beginning of a hint, and there's some other evidence as well, that it's the specific stereotype that is driving this lethal force bias more than uh, a more emotional kind of bias. Although we can try to parse those things later on because they start to blur into each other. Okay, so does this happen for police? Well, the simple thesis is there's absolutely no basis to assume that police do not also have implicit stereotypes. Their, their cognition is normal. Uh, they're exposed to the same influence as the rest of us are and maybe more in the enculturation that they experience as, through their training process. Um, and so they are simply, therefore, subject to stereotyping and implicit stereotyping as well. But we don't have to speculate. We can look to the data. And in fact, Eberhard and Goff and colleagues did this experiment with police officers. And they, too, showed pronounced tendencies to identify weapons faster after subliminal exposure hmm. to, um, to black faces than to white faces. Uh, uh, Ashby Plant and her colleagues and Josh Carell have done the shooter task with police samples and they also show shooter bias. They consistently show shooter bias in the speed with which they shoot. Uh, and in some samples, they show it in the tendency to erroneously shoot unarmed blacks more than unarmed whites. There have been a few samples where they didn't show that, but they are generally better at the task. 
and that gets that's going to take us to our final point, which is about training and discretion and constraining those things. So those are those two studies. Um, Eberhard and, and colleagues also showed that uh, when shown pictures of people uh, and asked to identify the ones that looked the most criminal, police officers tended to identify black faces. That's my. I'm done. I'm out of time. Okay. And, uh, and then we have all this indirect evidence from what we're seeing happening around us in terms of the New York uh, data from stop and frisk on disproportionate stops and searches and, and many other locations as well, uh, and the use of force information. And then um, some new data on police on police shootings that I find to be particularly compelling. So this is Omar Edwards and Christopher Ridley. They're police officers who were fatally shot while off duty by other police officers. And the New York State Task Force on Police on Police Shootings looked into cases like this. And, they, and among the police on police fatal shootings that they identified over about a 30 year period from about 1980 to 2010, uh, 10 of those cases involved uh, officers who were off duty and who were fatally shot. Now, if we look at the Bureau of Justice statistics data on the breakdown, the eth racial and ethnic breakdown of police in the US, about 75% of, of line officers in the US are white, and the rest are non-white. But if we look at the data on these admittedly small number of fatal shootings of off-duty officers, and I'm, I'm, we're talking off-duty, plain clothes, as opposed to undercover and on-duty plain clothes. Uh, the distribution there is that one out of those 10 was white, and nine out of the 10 were black or Latino. And actually, I've learned since creating this slide that it was eight were African American, one was Latino, and one was white. So, you know, we have to be careful. This is something that borders on anecdotal and statistical evidence, but we calculated, my, my student and I have calculated the probability that you would get this by chance, and it's, a, you know, it's less than one in a million. This is, this is a very unlikely to have occurred randomly, uh, given this base rate. So, um, uh, if you have one specific to that, if, if it's okay with Eva. It's cool. Mic coming, mic coming. I, yeah, wait for the <laughs> mic. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> A lot of the dialogue around the recent shootings of unarmed um, black people focused on them not following instructions or not complying or not um, or continuing to resist. And so this slide strikes me as kind of um, a rebuke to that line of argument because obviously off-duty police officers would not resist, would not disregard orders or any of the things they say the people that uh, were shot did. Yeah, thank you for, the, for that because that what I should have said in introducing that, which is one, one of the reasons this is so particularly compelling is that off-duty police officers ought to have a pretty good sense of how to behave. We know they're not actually engaged in crime. In most of these cases, they were either the victims of crime or they were trying, they were trying to help somebody else out, and they did have their weapons drawn. But the white officers in that circumstance don't get shot because they're seen differently. And the, uh, the other thing is that there's anecdotal evidence that indicates that um, black and Latino officers actually have a tendency to not draw their weapons when they're out of uniform mm -hmm. for this very reason. And so if anything, you would expect the rate to be lower based on their behavior. Um, but it's this powerful situation and police come to the scene and there's a man with a gun uh, and they see it as threatening or not depending on the race of the, of the individual. There's also, there are, what's also interesting is that among the cases of uh, plain clothes on duty and undercover officers, the racial disparities are much lower. They're still, minority officers are still slightly more likely to get fatally shot by other officers, but it's lower. And when you dig into that, it's really fascinating. They have all kinds of protocols for preventing that from happening. So they've got a, they've got a color code that they will yell out if there is a plain clothes or undercover officer in the vicinity, or they have some kind of vest that they put on, or they're wearing a hat of a particular color they have ways for signaling that. The off-duty officers, they don't, they're just, and, and they're more likely to be outside of the jurisdiction that they actually patrol, so they're not gonna be known to the other officers. All right, well, without harping too much on that. Um, 
So what, what can we do about this? I'm going to run through some basic recommendations, but then harp more on some that I think have, have more potential traction. Um, one thing is that we, you know, and this has already come up in Buju's presentation, that we, we can't just ask police to ignore race. We're not good at that as human beings. And in fact, if anything, it might have this rebound counterproductive effect. It's in fact better to acknowledge it. And that's where we met was over the racial privacy initiative. Right. Oh, that's right. uh, And one of the concerns was right. that if you know, people were told to ignore race and ethnicity and national origin, that, um, that in fact, all of the biases would still be present, but there would be nothing we could do about exactly. it. That's right. And so better, it better for police to acknowledge uh, the race of the person they're encountering so that they can start to uh, correct for the biases that they might have. This came up as well earlier, raising accountability when people expect to be held accountable for their actions and to have to articulate why they did what they did, they're less influenced by their stereotypes. Um, and this, this is a highfalutin legal aspiration, but uh, to the extent that we can move toward an intent to not discriminate standard as opposed to what we have now, which is the, the judicial standard is people are held to account for when they intend to discriminate. Um, so I don't have much optimism for that changing in the courts, but at the administrative level, police chiefs are free to hold their officers to an intent to not discriminate standard, an affirmative intent to not discriminate standard. I mean, maybe they'll get sued over it, <laughs> but that, that'll be a union battle. The, th the two things that I think have the most traction are community-oriented policing, but in a very evidence-based way, and limiting discretion that I'll get to in a moment. And I'm going to... I'm going to defer to Linda Tropp, who's one of the world leading experts on intergroup contact, who will be speaking this afternoon to talk about this. But community oriented policing is very popular, but it's, it's all willy nilly all over the map. Every department says they're doing community oriented policing, but it varies from department to department. And in some, it's, you know, they have one person who goes out and shakes hands once a week. And in some departments, they have some kind of systematic, uh, and sometimes it's part of the daily briefing, but it's all over the map. There's no theory driving how to do it, and there's no data coming out about how effective it is. And so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here for the opportunity to take what we know about intergroup contact and the things that maximize um, the benefits of intergroup contact and thinking about police and civilians as two different groups at, that, uh, that can promote trust in both directions and help police to differentiate individuals instead of seeing them as one whole. What I want to focus on is, oh no, no, this can't happen again. <laughs> I, yeah, this is the problem with building it on a Mac and then showing it on a PC. So, um, speaking of intergroup problems, oh, <laughs> well, that's not helping. Maybe that'll do it. There, great. It was just Adobe creating mischief. <laughs> okay, so um, so there's a very interesting case in point uh, where the discretion of law enforcement agents was constrained considerably, and the re results are very telling. And there's a little twist of irony in it, which is that it all was a result of Raymond Kelly's doing. <laughs> Ray Kelly was the chief of police, commissioner of police in New York during the ramping up, dramatic, radical ramping up of the stop and frisk program. But before that, he was uh, director of U.S. Customs, Commissioner of U.S. Customs, and he instituted changes to the protocols by which travelers would get searched. What's really interesting about customs is everybody is going through this bottleneck, and there's a discrete decision about who gets searched, as opposed to police officers patrolling and looking out and, and, and creating their own bottleneck. So it, it allows for fairly systematic analysis. Uh, but the most powerful thing that happened here was that Kelly said, these agents are using way too many criteria to make their determinations, and we should use more evidence-based criteria. So he reduced the criteria that they were using from 43 down to 6. And those 6 were things that were much more behaviorally oriented and had been shown to be related to smuggling, like you know, traveling, uh, traveling one with a one-way ticket only, paying cash for your fare. So some of the things that show up on terrorist profiles as well. And what they found was that uh, in the, so looking at the pre-new policy period to the post-new policy period, 
the number of searches went down 75%. So they were searching like 32,000 people. That went down to about 8,000 people in, two, in the year 2000 after the policy is put in place. But you'll see that the hits in terms of finding of contraband or finding of smuggling stay numerically about the same, the actual number. So when we calculate the hit rate, it goes through the roof. Hmm. And so what you're effectively getting is fewer people being hassled and searched, but just the same number of crimes being caught and, uh, and a much more efficient manner of policing. In terms of the discriminatory effects, the, the primary uh, victims of discrimination in this case were Latinos. And so what we see is that in 1998, um, their hit rate was very low, 1.4% compared to almost 6% for blacks and whites. And they were being searched at a much higher rate, especially proportional to their presence in the population. After the new policy goes into place, their hit rate comes up to now 13%. Everybody's hit rate goes up because they're doing this more rationally and effectively. And the Latino hit rate comes up, and that means that their disproportionality and their search rate goes down to a much more proportional level. So the actual disparate outcome here is reduced dramatically while the efficiency of the process is increased dramatically. So how does this relate to force? Well, you know, I'm going to make a leap, um, but I think it's a, a fairly um, plausible one, which is that in the case of customs, you have fewer stops and searches, and this has been shown in some other policing environments as well. This leads to reduced intrusion into people's lives, fewer people getting hassled and lower disparities. And something similar should be able to be done with use of force, which is that if there are constraints put on the situations under which force can be used and alternatives given to force, like de-escalation, uh, that would lead to less violence overall, but it should also reduce the disparities in doing that. This is kind of coming full circle to my, my claim that implicit bias is a problem, but it's not the root problem. And Sometimes we have to do an end run around it to constrain the behavior so that the implicit bias can't be taking up such a share of influence of what's happening. And so I'm happy to talk more about how, how this would happen. And, and actually, the, this came up earlier. I'm very happy to talk about the very specific kind of police training around use of force that could promote these kinds of outcomes. But I also want to leave, leave time for Eva, so I'm going to end it there. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be talking from the perspective of a, I was going to say African-American about these police shootings, but what I realized after the Michael Brown situation, the Eric Garner situation, it's not just black people who are so anguished about this. It's all people with good consciences and, and good sense. So I think everybody was, was pained. As, as you show those pictures of the two off-duty police officers who were shot, it's hard, it's hard to kind of get up and just talk, you know, because it's very painful. Because it could be my friend Bill McNeil, it could be Michael Harris, it could be Chris, it could be my brothers, my dad. Um, but I'll try to be um, objective and, pers and have a good perspective on things. As I was walking out between the sessions, I was thinking, well, I don't know as much as these academic folks about these, su these subjects. But I realized that in 1978, I was uh, at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle about an old black man, he's probably the age I am now, um, in Hunter's Point, who was shot by the police. He was known as Papa Charlie in the community, and the police said, oh, he ran into his bedroom and shot at us. And you know how certain things don't pass the smell test? It just didn't smell right. It goes to what uh, Dan was talking about, about your hunch. Um, and there was a hunch I had that that was just bullshit, and so to be non-academic. Um, so, Willie Brown, when he was still practicing law, Peter Cohen, who was one of the attorneys who did the San Francisco school desegregation case, and I ended up suing the city and county of San Francisco. And this is what turned out to have happened. We were like CSI before there were CSI. We had like, um, what was Turner's, what was Turner's first name? Chuck. Chuck Turner. Yeah, he did, he drew up this like mock-up for us of the, of the uh, room, of the apartment, and this was, really before CSI, and we did the uh, gun trajectory, and it turned out the trajectory of the bullets were going down. And so he was in his bed like this, and the police came in and fired down at him. It turned out that he could not walk, 
So it was just a lie that he ran into his room. He had to use a little pulley, and he put money in, and he, he's on the second floor of a place in Hunter's Point. He used a little pulley and put his money. The kids would, would get his, the money, get his food, put it in the basket, and then he'd pull it up. And so um, we ended up suing. When we took their depositions, the police came into the depositions armed. Um, and we were like freaking out that, well, I'm going to have a little plastic gun and show that. And I went, no, that's probably not a good idea. So we called the Chief Judge Peckham and said they're armed. Um, and he said, well, you can come down to the police, to the uh, federal building, and take your depositions here because they cannot come in armed. But we thought they were trying to mess with us. And so we said, no, we're not. We're not I was afraid, but we're not afraid. We're just going to take your depositions here. And we know what you're trying to do. And we know you shot this black man because he's a poor black man in Hunter's Point, And you thought you could get away with lying. So we ended up getting a good settlement. Um, and it was, it was a scary lawsuit. But as I was thinking about this topic, I was thinking, no, I, I don't know the, I haven't done empirical studies on this, but I've seen this up close. So when I saw the whole situation with Mr. Walter Scott and how they lied, and all police officers don't lie, I'm not into that. Many of us lie when we're backed up against the wall. But oftentimes, if the victim's dead, there's nobody to uh, refute the story. And so when they said he ran, he, I was in fear for my life, an important theme and what I'm going to talk about, um, often the, there's nobody there to correct the lie. So, um, so that's my background for this. I want to riff off something that Michael Harris started his comments with uh, yesterday. He talked about the fact that we cannot understand this phenomenon without thinking about slavery. And so just I, in the morning, I'm reading New York Times, New Yorker, and then kind of more trashy stuff, too. But I happened to come across a very interesting article this morning in the New Yorker. It was an interview with one of the first black uh, transit police officers in New York City. And they made reference to a book called Black Police in America by a man named W. Marvin Delaney, who I've never heard of before. And he talked about some interesting things that made me think of what you were talking about, Michael. He said in the 1700s, I guess before we were even a country, um, the colonies enacted laws to regulate the behavior of the kidnaps, kidnap, kidnaps, I can't even say it, kidnapped Africans. I think some of these were referred to as black codes. Some of the black codes established what they call slave patrols. This was, in, in Mr. Delaney's view, the first distinctively American police system. And it set the pattern of how African Americans are dealt with by police in this country. Something I'm going to be riffing off you a lot, Michael. Um, but you ask a question about uh, the fact that it's often said that black folks are shot because we don't follow orders. Now, think about what it was to be a slave in the 1700s. You're supposed to do what you were told. You're supposed to be subservient. You could be shot for running away. You could be really stigmatized and shot and beaten and harmed for speaking up and being uppity. So this was the whole frame of the slave patrollers as they, was, as they were looking at the behavior of the Africans. I, they weren't, we weren't African Americans in 1700. We were just Africans. Um, so at the same time, you've got the abolitionist movement in the, in the 1800s going. And as I'm thinking about this, I think of it as being somewhat analogous to the Black Lives Matter movement. You had people looking at the dominant um, trajectory and dominant narrative of the country and saying, we don't like this. But there was the, the, maybe the analog of the Tea Party back in the day in the, in the 1850s. And California played a very central role in this because they were trying to determine if California was going to come into the Union as a free state or a state where slaves could be. And the um, trade-off for having California as a free state was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And I think this gives us a very important historical uh, bit of information about why things are the way they are. The Fugitive Slave Act authorized federal agents to help, find, detain, and restore, return escaped persons. I won't, will not say slaves. Escaped persons to bondage. Something I just found about, out about this morning was that citizens were required to assist in the recovery of runaway people. So that's where you have the first kind of circum, deep, huh? 
that, that if you saw somebody and you thought they were a runaway person from the South, um, you were um, in, kind of in, in panel to do something about this. My friend Bill McNeil told me that I should not go see the movie 12 Years a Slave because he knows me, and he knows I would not have recovered to this day had I watched the movie. But from what I can understand, the uh, protagonist in the movie was somebody who was free and was taken to the South. So there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So just by the color of your skin, all kinds of people made assumptions about you and felt they could use force against you to do what um, they wanted you to do. And the free states, so-called free states, were as implicated in this as the southern states as well. So what I want to talk about, because Jack did a great job on talking about how police use lethal force, I want to talk about how private citizens use lethal force against unarmed black folks, Latinos, Asian Americans, and how they get away with it. You think about Trayvon Martin. I didn't have time to look up her name, but I think her name is Renisha McBride, the woman who went to the door of somebody and just got shot away. I cannot remember the name of the young black man who was shot for playing his music too loud. Um, it's hard to even talk about this stuff because you can imagine it happening to you or your friends, and it's just so wrong, and it just goes on. But if you think about it, these are vestiges of using force to get the runaway slaves. It's the same, it's the same political, historical dynamic you know, that has been with us for a long time. Um, it's, it's also, if you think about it, it's killing black people who are perceived as being threatening. Um, it has an a, a overview, of, for some people, of white supremacy. I'm white. You're playing your music too loud. Turn that damn radio down. I can shoot you. Uh, you're Trayvon Martin. You're walking in the neighborhood. What are you doing here? I can shoot you. Um, the common denominator of the police rationale for getting away with using lethal force and the rationale in stand your ground laws, and this has this circles back to the scientific information that you've been hearing for the past few days, is that if you feel threatened, you can use lethal force. You see the police always saying, I felt my life was in danger. You hear in the stand your ground laws, if you feel your life is threatened, you may use lethal force. Now check out the social science. Black people are associated with criminality, aggression, and violence. If you see our faces, you equate us with apes. We are seen as not human. We are seen as having superhuman properties. Um, the part of your brain that lights up when you see a black face is the same part of your brain that lights up when you see a snake or a spider. So if you just see us, you're freaking out. And so anybody is going to be able to say, I felt threatened. I felt in danger. Because we are just seen as inherently dangerous. Think about some of the things that Darren Wilson said, who uh, shot Michael Brown. He said, Michael Brown appeared to be a demon. He just seemed to be a demon. And this has this whole notion of us as not quite human. He also said just the most batshizzy, crazy thing I've ever heard. He said, it looked like Michael Brown wanted to run through the bullets. <laughs> that, that's just crazy. But if you think of us as subhuman or super physical, we're like, I guess he, he thought the bullets were kryptonite or something like that. I get the metaphor mixed up. But he he he. he didn't quite think of us as, as a normal person. Something you didn't mention that I've heard Phil Goff talk about is that there's a high correlation not just with implicit bias, but with um, the, the sense of masculinity that a particular officer will have. And if the officer has certain issues about this, this may result in the officer using lethal force. And uh, excuse my French, but I've already said bullshit, so you already know who you're dealing with. But apparently, Michael Wilson called um, uh, Darren Wilson, the P word, the P with three letters and a Y at the end. So he was impugning his um, masculinity in some way, and so maybe this triggered the extreme overreaction of, of Darren Wilson. So if you think about the police and if you think about the stand your ground laws, this unconscious fear of black people allows justification for shooting us and getting away with it and not being indicted and being found not guilty um, in a court of law. One of the things that I found when I was looking at the Stand Your Ground laws is that a lot of the Stand Your Ground laws are in the South, but California has a Stand Your Ground law, which I'm sure most people do not know about that, that's on the books. And the problem with the Stand Your Ground laws is that it 
basically eviscerates the use of alternatives that might work, like retreating. In some states, if you feel you're in danger and you can retreat, you're supposed to leave. In stand your ground states, even if you can retreat, you don't have to. You can pull out your pistol and shoot somebody dead. And we know that this is gonna, the hammer's gonna come down much more um, strongly on black and brown people. Dr. John Roman, who's a senior fellow at the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute, two years ago found this in Stand Your Ground States. When you have a white shooter, white shooter, and a black victim, the murder is justified 17% of the time. White shooter, black victim. Black shooter, white victim is justified 1% of the time. So you see the racial bias that's there. In non-stand your ground states, every, uh, with, when there's a white shooter and a black victim, it's justified just over 9% of the time. So it seems like things work out a little bit better in the um, non-stand your ground states. Paul Henderson, who is an attorney in the city who you often will see on MSNBC, gave this information. When an older white man, this is one I wish I had a PowerPoint, when an older white man kills a younger black man, older white man, younger black man, it's justified 49% of the time, about half of the time. When it's reversed, when it's an older black man who kills a younger white man, it's justified 9% of the time. So you see the built-in racial bias, how we are seen as dangerous, how it's okay to kill us, um, and it's, it's kind of chilling. And that's why um, Michael kind of put us in this frame of mind at the very beginning of the uh, construction of this conference to look at why are we being shot and why are people getting away with it. So my conclusion about this is pretty self-evident that the lethal force that's used against black people by police and private citizens or residents is a combination of mind science, the notion that we are just inherently dangerous and scary and need to be put down, coupled with what Michael pointed out, the legacy of slavery, that the state empowered people to hunt us down, shoot us, bring us back, to be subservient, to um, not talk back. Uh, we didn't learn that lesson very well. So what do we do? I have some, some random thoughts. I think the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement is critically important. And I was so distressed after the non-indictments of um, Darren Wilson and the people who choked Earl Garner, Eric Garner, to death. But when I saw people out on the streets, it wasn't just black people, it was everybody. Everybody represented in this, in this room was on, we were on the streets upset, crying, upset. And so that made me feel not so isolated. It's important that there be a multiracial movement. I think part of what's been so powerful with the videos that people have seen is that black folks have known about this for a long time, Latino folks as well. We've known that people get stopped for no damn reason. But seeing the video, of Earl, um, Eric Garner, I keep, Earl Garner is a piano player, organist, speaking of jazz, um, and uh, seeing Michael Brown's body in the street for so long, seeing Mr. Walter Scott shot as he was running away, seeing Freddie Gray being dragged into the paddy wagon, something that, um, I, I don't know if anybody mentioned this, but FBI Director Comey is Irish American, and he said there used to be stereotypes about Irish Americans as drunkard who, drunken hooligans, and he said, and what do we call the um, vehicle that we take people to the police in a paddy wagon? Until I heard that, I never had connected that with Irish Americans ever in life. So this stuff goes on uh, over and over. So the multiracial movement's very important. Videos, that's very important. You may see in some states, they're trying to stop people from taking videos of police officers. It's like, please. Um, changes in the law. A number of us will be meeting with Governor Brown tomorrow morning, just across the street. Um, and we've been pushing AB 86, which calls for independent investigations of police shootings. If the police think they're never gonna be indicted, they're not going to stop. And, and all police aren't bad. They're normal people, as you, as you pointed out. But there are some bad ones. Um, police training is important. We think stand your ground laws should be repealed. They just are a license to kill. Um, I personally think we should just ban guns. There are just too many guns in the country. I don't see why there are guns. Last year, I was supposed to say this because we're doing a video. Thing. Um, one person was killed in, in Britain by police and this year and last year zero. In 
China, there were 12 people killed. They have four times our population. There were 1,000 people killed, over 1,000. There were, there were some statistics last night that Chris Hayes said at his, um, on his show. They said that something like the Guardian and the Washington Post said something around 400 people have already been killed this year uh, in America, and two-thirds of the unarmed people who were shot are Latino and African American. The last thing I want to say is we need to stay strong. This is very depressing, but all of you are like ripples, and you're going to go different places and take this information, take the social science. You know now some of the smartest people in the country who can help you give this background. You've got people uh, defending people on death row. You've got some of the best people in the world in this room. So it's important that we're sharing this information with you. Um, when the next black person gets shot, I'll remember all your faces, and then it bothers you as much as it bothers me. So, Chris, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Uh, yeah, I'll start with questions, but I just wanted to add real quick, and I'm riffing off of both uh, Jack and Eva's presentations. Um, there's a piece of history that's often uh, overshadowed or not really introduced into this conversation, and it's the kind of pre-civil rights era in which there were many, many, many hundreds of lynchings. And so there is a project that uh, a wonderful professor by the name of Margaret Burnham has been doing at Northeastern University School of Law called the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project. And in this project, the law students actually investigate civil rights era lynchings that occurred. And I was a part of this project. And so basically, we looked at a compiled list of only 200 names, just the names and the date of birth, or the date of death, rather, sorry, of individuals that we had just heard were lynched. And so it was the students' uh, task to investigate all of these uh, names from Google and, and libraries and all these different areas to try and compile whatever information we could actually get about the individual who uh, was murdered. Um, the DOJ reported that that was just the list of names that they knew about, but that they had had other names that they couldn't really um, uh, find enough information to validate up into probably 400. 500 people who had been lynched and that we just couldn't find enough information to track them down. Uh, I particularly had one person by the name of Isaiah Nixon who was murdered uh, for trying to vote in 1948. Um, so there's a part of this narrative, uh, the first modern uh, police force was the slave patrol. There's a part of a narrative of the slave patrol not being officer officers, but just regular folks who were trying to uh, catch runaway slaves and or uh, uh, captured individuals. And that carrying on throughout our history, this narrative of silencing individuals, uh, regular citizens being able to lynch, kill, murder uh, African Americans who were seen or perceived as being a threat, uh, wanting to vote, owning property, uh, having land. A lot of land, a lot of contracts were just taken up from underneath a lot of these individuals and they were murdered as a result of that. Their narratives, their stories have not been shared uh, largely and it's not, never, it's not really talked about because this is, again, a way of silencing voices. Eva mentioned, if, but for modern technology and having video, a lot of these narratives and stories wouldn't even be heard or known of. So just adding that into this really incredibly sad and depressing but very true kind of history of this country. Thank you. Um, I had a question that sort of uh, was brought up and is in the background background a little bit about the videos and the images. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you're right. One of the things that this, this attention has brought and the new technology has brought is increased um, uh, images of, you know, Michael Brown laying in the street or Oscar Grant or, um, you know, you could even go back to Emmett Till and talk, and talk about images that are a rallying cry for people. Um, but at the same time, these are still black bodies that are like mutilated in some cases and that uh, images are being circulated widely. And at the same time, there seems to be like this um, media resistance to the, the popular resistance that's happening. There's the, the repression in the images of that. And so I'm wondering, is there any concern, is there any fear that these images might kind of backfire or that saturating um, kind of the internet or the web with these images, um, there might be some effects that, uh, you know, we're not aware of and that could maybe hurt people later. I just, uh, I'm, I always wonder how to walk that line when I see these images, which, you know, they, they don't stand to stop, really. Before we answer, do you have a thought about that? I think you do. No, I mean, it's, it's a genuine question. I, I really, am, I'm not sure how to hold both of those two things. give that a shot. I, I think that, um, and Buju referenced this earlier, that 
um, again, at the implicit level, our, our minds are fairly simplistic. And there's another phenomenon called a sleeper effect, which is when you're exposed to um, information that's got some conditional property to it. So you see a black person, and they're the victim of, of the violence. Uh, later on, your memory might just associate black with violence. And I, is that kind of what you're getting at? That yeah, all the inferences that make that don't have to Yeah. So it's not clear that uh, it, it's not clear that the, all of the video that's coming out is necessarily long term going to change people's attitudes. What it is doing clearly is changing our attitudes toward policing and raising our awareness of what's going on. And I would maintain that this problem is not at all <laughs> new. Um, police have been using excessive force against people of color forever and probably long before the slave trade. But, uh, but the, what's new is, is our ability to document it uh, and, and to transmit that information in real time. And that's part of what's, what's going on. I come at it as an activist and I remember uh, Emmett Till's mother wanted his his open casket shown to people and it invigorated the civil rights movement. It was like, oh, hell no. And so what, I, what I'm seeing in terms of statistics is that the number of people who believe that police are often unfair to people of color is going up and a lot of it is because of the images. The Trayvon Martin, we never saw what happened, but we saw Michael Brown's body. We saw Walter Scott running and shot in the back, and we knew the police officer lied about it. Now, black people have been saying for a long time, police lie. We're, oh, no, 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 they don't lie. Some of them lie. We saw Eric Garner being choked to death. Um, and so I think in terms of my, from my perspective as an activist, the images are very important because they, they let people know that what we've been co complaining about is real. I can't answer it from the social science point of view in the long, the long run. I've, I have a, just a, a quick comment about that, which is just to, to add to uh, what Jack Laser uh, was saying. The, 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 the images are important, but, you know, but people do tend to incorporate the information based on the schemas they already have. Mm. So that you know, you, even if you know, the images are so emotionally evocative that they can, they can evoke a, a defense mechanism, mm -hmm. right? Of the kind of like, oh, you know, but you know, they're resisting arrest or, or you know, mm -hmm. even even in the absence of evidence. So I just want to okay. reify what you said, which is that the the narrative, the Black Lives Matter narrative, the narrative of how to frame this, uh, the 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 viewing of the images mm. is so important because the more widespread that that understanding comes, the better frame people will have to understand it as opposed to interpret it from, from alternative uh, points of view. So I think that the, the images are, are so important in the context of, or I should say, the, the movement is so important in the context, or they're mutually um, important for, for the interpretation of each other. So it's important for people like us to talk about this and talk with our friends and go on the radio and do blogging and Facebook to just frame it, frame it. Okay. 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 Cool. 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 I would add real quickly: the images are also important just because of the ways in which police are able to excuse ex uh, excessive force. Mm -hmm. So if a police officer is able to claim that he was in fear of a, of a uh, potential offender, whether or not it's true or not, that gives them a little bit of a pass in terms of not being found guilty of actually having excessive force. And so many police officers are actually trained on what to say in the event they have a, they murder a, a suspect. Uh, so that's a very important interchange of, of the power struggle that's uh, present. Other questions? I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about what elements of community policing are effective. You said it's sort of all over the place, and can you talk a little bit more about what's actually working? No, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Nobody knows what's working. Um, but but here are, here are some thoughts. Uh, so um, what we do know from work by Linda Trop and others uh, on contact is that there are conditions that that optimize 
the effects of intergroup contact to cause it to reduce prejudice. And it's a little bit of a multiple, multi-pronged approach with policing because you, the, the idea of the contact would be to reduce the police officer's prejudice toward communities of color, but it would also have the effect of in, improving trust amongst the community toward the police, which is something that police really embrace and really there's a whole movement on promoting trust. And so um, what we need to do is get people like Linda at the table with people like former Oakland Police Captain Ron Davis, who's now the head of the Community Oriented Policing Services at the Department of Justice, and and figure out how how to invest in in contact theory driven community oriented policing programs and then invest in proper evaluation to see. Now, I, I want to plug the project that I'm working on, which is the National Justice Database that Phil Goff and I are the co-principal investigators on, where we are signing up major city police departments to give us, to collect in a standardized way and give us their data on pedestrian and vehicle stops and use of force incidents. And we will, through that project, because we're also going to be able to be, be tracking the policies that they're using and the programs like community-oriented policing will be able to start tracking what is effective in terms of the outcomes that they, they have. So there's, you know, there's an opportunity now um, to use the theory and the science to promote better practices and then to actually evaluate the effectiveness of those practices, but it's going to take some effort. More questions? So just a couple of comments on the things that have already been said. My understanding is that when uh, community policing first started, that's when the, um, the school resource officers went into the schools, um, and that's how they got there to begin with. So that's something that it was meant to be helpful and to promote community um, relations with the police, but obviously from the presentations that we heard yesterday, it backfired. Um, and then as far as the question about the images, I understand seeing the images of of, of um, the victims uh, laying on the street um, and the images that those promote, my concern has been that it's normalizing, mm. um, seeing mm. black lives laying in the street and then it's, it becomes acceptable. Mm. And then my last comment is on your comments about what images or what um, prompts comes up for us when we see a black face. And just um, one of the things that has been so striking to me since I was a, a child is seeing um, the um, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. They're all depicted as fair-skinned men, <laughs> except for one, oh, Judas. Oh, goodness. I need to look at that again. Well, and every Disney movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to that point, why do we say the term fair skin? What does that mean, and what kind of biases are we invoking when we well, use that term all the time? Hi, I just have a question, being Latina. Is, um, and I hear a lot about, and I'm very involved in the whole process. As a matter of fact, we'll be, I'll be presenting in June in Salinas, California, um, where we have a huge, huge, huge problem with uh, officer-involved shootings and um, the death of a lot of minority children, actually, under age, um, as well as immigrants who have come. M most recent one being a gentleman was um, working in his yard. He had some shears. Somebody thought he was trying to break into his own house. They called the police. They turned around. He turned around. He had the shears, and they just drilled him, drilled him, uh, probably with more bullets than uh, the professor was staying in the UK <laughs> or China even. Um, it's been a consistent problem. And so one of the things that we're looking at, we are working with the city, et cetera, but how do we work with a group of marginalized people that were not only um, enslaved but conquered in their own country and still are considered the slaves of today's work environment. And how do we do that in a small cultural agricultural, a small agricultural community where the livelihood of that remains on the backs of these people 
and um, where currently they have a shortage of employ of of employees, where they're actually saying we need strawberry pickers, we need lettuce pickers. I mean, that's the first time in my life I, I was raised and born there. It's the first time I've ever seen that. And then the other thing that you know is just the silencing of not having a voice for the Latino community, the Mexican community. I'm not a good Mexican, I'll tell you all that, okay? I'm not a good Mexican, and so... Um, what does that mean? And it means that what you were saying, I oh, you haven't learned how to that. listen. <laughs> I haven't learned <laughs> to be quiet. Got it, got it, got um, it. <laughs> so one of the things that I look at as I, I see it is that, you know, we have, have we don't put the the vision of the Latino up in, we have the black community out there, but the Latino voice is very silenced and of what is occurring to us as well um, on a consistent and regular basis. I get profiled all the time at the airport. I have to leave actually three or four hours earlier because I get stopped and I get fully searched, fully searched for some reason, I have no idea why. But what do we do about that as a Latino community who's still being conquered on a consistent and regular basis when we still have immigrants coming across the border who are still considered or named illegal um, yet are required for that? I have Bracero family members from the past. Um, my grandfather lived in the worst labor camps. I didn't even know. It was just normal life for me. We'd you know, go visit him. So how do we address that in regards to whether there is a a built caste system in our society that we do not address ever. I have a couple of comments. Um, we're involved in litigation in Bakersfield because black and Latino kids are disproportionately suspended and expelled from school. And we know that there are unfortunately tensions between the black and brown community in Bakersfield. So we had this wonderful unity dinner uh, two weeks ago tomorrow um, where a, a, a black farm worker, a brown farm worker and a black parent were and we asked questions about each other. And then it turned out there were so many similarities. They had the same vision for their kids. Two, one pair, both of the kids wanted to be chefs. So we we're thinking about starting a business down the line. We were originally called to Bakersfield because the police had beaten a, a Latino man to death. And so we were trying to figure out ways to, to work there. So we're working with the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Um, I don't know if we can come to Salinas, but sometimes and this is the lawyer speaking, sometimes suing people gets people's attention. Um, and so that might be something you look at. I don't know if you work with PICO, there's Faith in Action, Kern County, which is a, a PICO-oriented group. I'm sure they've got people in Salinas. I'm bad on geography, so I don't know if Salinas is Kern County. Okay. Oh, good, good. couple of other things. Um, somebody, the Black Lives Matter group sent me a list of all the black folks who had been killed by name in 2014 and 2015. I was in contact with some of my Latino colleagues saying, why don't we come up with a similar list like that? Because I think there isn't the consciousness broadly that this is happening to Latino people as well. So we'd be very happy to work with you on that project. And I could connect all of us with the other people who said, let's pull this together. And then the other thing is, I'm working with some people who are, I, I sue people, that's what I do. Um, I, I'm, I'm nice to talk about social science, but if I had a tattoo, it would say born to sue. So we, we are looking for a, dist, a district or a jurisdiction that is not really handling 
um, the way they interact with communities of color very well. Too many beatings, too many shootings, too many stops. So if you're, we could talk with you about that. There are other people here who are nicer, who will do it in a much more collegial way. I'm sure they'll identify themselves. But maybe we should keep in touch, and maybe we could come down there and meet with you and bring some of the PICO people with us to figure out a way to do it. I'm not a community organizer. I'm just not. Um, so, but le please, let's stay in touch and figure out what we can do. But I may get you in trouble. OK. That's a good thing. Uh, real quickly, I was, while I'm walking to the back, uh, it's really interesting in terms of just the idea around the US Census and the creation of Hispanic as a category. And so there's a perceived whiteness among uh, Latino folks prior to 1950s and the construction of this Hispanic entity or a group. Um, and so now if you look at death row, uh, Latinos are, are continuously uh, purported, purported to be uh, dangerous monsters compared as being like insects and individuals deserving of being executed. Mm. Um, and there's some data emerging from that. So one of the challenges I'm seeing um, is so hearing the conversation about implicit bias, right, black men being dangerous, et cetera, I'm starting to see where I've seen um, kind of the spokespeople of the movement not being folks who are actually well, somewhat being, but in large part not being folks who are actually most of the time profiled, right, like young black men from West Oakland, from East Oakland, mm -hmm. from the communities. So a lot of times, it's, it, and a lot of the movement is being framed and pushed by folks for them, mm -hmm. right? Got um, it, got it. So it's it's kind of hard because they're not participating in their own liberation to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times by choice because they have criminal records um, and things of that nature. So it, part of it is like, how do we get, are we, go, are we moving towards a, a kind of a policy frame where now, now police officers look at things differently? But what about the humanization? You can't legislate humanization, right? So if I'm not able to participate in my own uh, liberation because it'll actually... Um, hinder the movement, then what are we really trying to accomplish? I just wanted your thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about Chris, because I remember those young men that, that came to your, our office for a meeting, and they were people who had records, but I think they were out there in front. So I, I think, and, I, and I'm much more from a policy point of view, um, so I can't speak to it directly. But I think there are people who are directly impacted who are in leadership. Am I, am I incorrect? Yeah, you're correct. They, uh, those are both members of the Black Organizing Project okay. here in uh, Oakland. Mm -hmm. right, like I, so I know Black Organizing Project, and I'm, I'm just talking about in general. If you really look at who's the leaders of kind of the movement around, right, and this is maybe close talk, right, um, to a certain degree, it some of it is like I'm. I'm asking, um, is there a, is it dangerous? Not dangerous. Is it is it productive to not have those folks leading no. the conversation? No, I think they. I think they should be out there. Absolutely. So, um, are are you feeling like people with records are being excluded, or are you just saying that other people are kind of taking the lead and leaving other people behind? Is it is it conscious exclusion? I'm saying the black man with with dreads, outside of what I, I saw in Ferguson, and and again, what happens to that? These guys are looting and going crazy, like the that's the frame, right? Outside of that, was what you see most of the time. It's not that brother who's like literally directly impacted consistently, actually out front talking about what's happening. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify. To clarify, there's been some criticism around the Black Lives Matter, and I don't want to dig digress from the, the point of, or the, the topic of the mm -hmm. panel, but there has, I've been talking too quickly, there has been some uh, criticism acknowledged or lifted up about the representatives of the Black Lives Matter not actually being black men or young black oh, men, but more young black women. And so there's been some concerns around whether or not black men are actually really visible and in interacting in this space or whether or not they're just kind of the poster child for some of the actions and looking at ways to really include them in. And I don't want to say that comment and to the exclusion of our, black, our brown brothers and sisters who are also being shot down and attacked uh, by uh, police. So, Could you, Do you have any information on what's been done to react to that or deal with that? Are, are there more black men being put forward? 
I think I do not have any information on whether or not that's changing. I know that's a, certainly a concern. And so uh, it's one that's ongoing. And as you know, it's, it's new. And, and trying to figure out how to respond to that uh, is, is, you know, in process. Are you Brandon? Um, we, we've been working in coalition with some of the Black Lives Matter people in terms of this legislation to get independent investigations of police shootings. Is there any message you'd like me to carry to Alicia? about this? So my folks are at the table, Mike McBride, um, I don't know if you know him, Pico Network, that's that's one of my mentors. So well, I'm, I'm aware of the conversation. My piece was more about like, y how effective is the movement in terms of humanizing these brothers if they can't be at the forefront of it um, long term, right? I'm for Because there, there's certain policies you can get to and then I feel like you get to that next level when those brothers are seen as human beings. Mm -hmm. And not just, yes, we are going to assume they're, we are going to have biases towards them, so let's put a policy in place that, despite your bias, we'll be able to kind of circumvent it a little bit. I'm saying, like, once they're seen as human, mm -hmm. now the policies go even further and we're able to do some real, um, some real work, some, Can some I better. Can ask something? Because I'm real, like, uh, is there anything you think we can do as this group or we as EJS to, d to help? Yes. We dealt with the school district where the lawyer said, everybody has implicit bias, there's nothing you can do about that. And now there are some people in this room who are going to that school district, and now the school district is going to give employees a version of that test. And so I think as, a, as an organizing group, we don't think implicit bias is here to stay, and we're trying to figure out how to get it out of ourselves and how to, how to get it out systematically. So. Um, Please don't take away the message that we just think it's just here to stay. So, Professor I, Powell. Well, it is true. All indication is that the, the the nature of the mind is that it's uh, the nature of the unconscious is that it's um, it will make association it will make associations. What the associations are and what they mean is social. So. We are going to have associations, so in that sense, we're not going to see the world just as it is. But it doesn't mean we're always going to see black people as being inferior or dehuman. Mm -hmm. That's social. Mm -hmm. That's constantly changing. It's changing. It's changed since the 1950s. It's going to change again. Uh, and how it changed, and again, going back to your points, Jack, is that it's not just implicit bias. It's looking at the interaction between structures, bias, culture. So what we do matters. It matters a lot. Um, and so Jack started off his presentation by saying it's not a silver bullet, but it is a bullet. Well, you didn't say that, but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what we do actually matters. And, and, and one of the problems is that we make interventions. And even if we make interventions at one place, then we throw people back out into a larger system mm. where we see 5,000 images a day. Um, so whether you interact with your children at home and then they're, they're listening to stuff. So it has to be multiple prong. But there certainly should not be the assumption that this is just a static situation right. we're stuck with. Because uh, I think that would be a very uh, serious disservice to what we're trying to do. That's not the message at all. Question in the back. Well, I was just going to say that I think that for any movement that to be successful, that the people that are the most affected by it have to be at the table. So I was just reacting. I mean, I, I am not an expert. I am certainly not in that group, but that's my view, and I think probably other people in this room share that view. Just a quick time check. Uh, we have about seven minutes until 12.30, lunchtime. Uh, so more questions? Well, 
while you, while you're looking for a questioner, I just I wanted to provide a piece of context that I think is valuable when thinking about these things. Uh, coming back to policing in particular, there are approximately eighteen thousand law enforcement agencies in the United States, and most of them have ten officers or fewer in them, and most officers work in departments that are small. And as a result of that, and also as a cause of that, um, policing is highly decentralized in America. Right. And one, one thing we might want to look to is that it, it's much more centralized in the UK. Um, and I'm not sure if that can, if that can be attributed, or if the, the lower rate of, of police use of force there can be attributed to that, but I wouldn't be entirely surprised. But it is decentralized here, and one of the tools that we have for changing policing is lawsuits, <clears throat> and groups like EJS do that, and the ACLU, and the NAACP, and the Department of Justice does it. But with 18,000 departments, um, it's a little bit of a whack-a-mole situation. And so there does need to be more systemic change, and I think that, you know, again, what we're seeing as a movement growing has the potential to, to change to change it system systemically, but the you know the suits are are a fuel to that as well. It's a, it's all a part of a larger movement and growing awareness. And I agree that it has to that represented in that movement have to be the people who are the primary players and stakeholders and the ones who whose lives stand to change the most. And, and you raise a good point because um, I can be very elitist and I'd like let's sue somebody and then somebody goes well don't you think you need to talk to the people who you're representing and we try to but it's easy as a lawyer to just go off to the races so thank you for putting that thought back in, in our minds or my mind thank you thanks I, I saw partly in your bio um, I was wondering if you could speak about the, some of the trainings you're doing, talking about doing trainings for police or training for judges and what is included in that and, um, yeah. So um, I haven't been doing trainings for judges in a while, um, but about 10 years ago I was doing them and there's something called the uh, Council for Judicial Education and Research, which is a California um, project that helps with continuing education for judges and they brought me in and I, I gave much longer versions of this kind of thing with more emphasis on the implicit bias part. Um, and it's still to this day, as even though it's every once in a while I'll meet a judge and I'll say, oh yeah, I, I was at your, uh, your training all those, all those years ago. And I had one jury selection episode that was kind of haunting where I think the judge tried to throw my own stuff back in my face because <laughs> she had been in my training. But anyway, so the... Um, what I'm happy to say is that my presentations have been institutionalized and every judge entering the California bench um, sees, gets this, some kind of training like this and it's in their judicial ethics handbook and, and so um, that's been somewhat institutionalized. The other edge to this sort is that since doing that, I'm a little less sanguine about the effects of these kinds of trainings. I do think that with populations like judges, because their job is inherently about deliberation and promoting good deliberation, that talking in the abstract about how these things happen can help, but you still have to be careful to avoid the situation where you, a judge has gone through a training and now they think they're inoculated mm -hmm. and they can go back to business as usual. So that's one of the risks involved in what we call implicit bias training. Buju was talking about debiasing which is these very specific methods that have been shown generally fleetingly, but, but nevertheless shown to actually change implicit bias. But we don't have, uh, to use John, John's metaphor, we don't have a, a silver bullet yet for debiasing people. And that's kind of why I'm emphasizing constraining discretion, because until we know how to lastingly um, change people's implicit biases and Personally, I think it's more of a generational exercise and a structural exercise. But you know, until we get there, um, we have to also look at other methods for reducing the impact of the biases. So in most of my work, I don't talk about changing the biases. I talk about reducing the impact of the biases on the decision making. And that's something we, we 
can be a little more concrete about. And I am working with police, but we're, we're way not ready for prime time on how to train, train police. I will say, though, getting back to what Leslie was saying earlier about police use of force and training, I never thought I would find a Bruce Lee quote to be so compelling, but that's what I hear from officers is that when they get into that situation, uh, they go down to their lizard brain. When they're being shot at or when they just think that their life is in danger, um, they are terrified. And they have told me, they, uh, several have told me that they soiled themselves in that situation. And so they, want, they need to have that training that they can fall back on. And Leslie's exact, exactly right. It has to be highly repetitive and it has to be realistic. So you now have departments that are talking about what they call reality-based training. And they do it with live actors and they do it out in the scene and they do use paint guns. And it, can't, it will never simulate the real fear of death. Um, but to the extent that it can be repeated and approximate that more than an officer in that situation has a better chance of using a higher part of his or her brain uh, to to prevent that kind of uh, that kind of automatic response, but it's uh, it's a tall order. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was good. We're a good team. <laughs>